we were broke. We couldn't do any of those things. We had to find ways to build a culture just by the way we treat one another. And guess what? It doesn't take time. You just have to show up to the meetings and treat your teammates with that love and compassion and kindness, which doesn't cost anything. So it doesn't cost you time. It doesn't cost you money. So those excuses are down the drain. I'm Patrick Pacheco, and you're listening to Season 3 of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we share our wealth of knowledge to help you navigate the opportunities ahead, because that's what Cadence is all about, the expertise and flexibility to do business on your terms. We're empowered to help, whether it's through our podcast or any of our more than 350 locations across the South and Texas. Most of us spend 40 hours a week, at least, at our jobs. That's half your waking life. Monday to Friday. Our most attentive hours, when the sun is shining and our coffee is kicked in, are spent with coworkers, colleagues, and bosses. How much better would the world be if everyone loved going to work? It was a place that made us feel valued and excited. That's the vision of our guests today. My name is Mohammed Anwar. I'm the president and CEO of Softway and Culture Plus. I'm uh, also the co-author of a Wall Street Journal bestselling book called Love as a Business Strategy. My name is Chris Petrie, and I'm the vice president of Softway and the co-founder of Culture Plus, which is a subsidiary of Softway. Mohammed and Chris are just two of the minds behind the concept of love as a business strategy. And while that might sound crazy, it has the potential to be revolutionary. So for our next two episodes, we'll be exploring their ideas. Next week, we'll get down to the nitty gritty of love as a business strategy, systems and strategies to empower employees, hire winners, and create honest feedback. But today, I want to tell you a story. It's a love story, but not the kind you're used to. It's how a leader learned to love his team, and in doing so, transformed his company and himself. But before we start, we need to know, what is love as a business strategy? In the simplest of the terms, love as a business strategy is where people are the center of any business decisions. And there's a misconception that exists inherently in the, in the corporate world that it's people or profit. And uh, our decisions are at the cost of people, right? Like, hey, if you want to make more profit, cut the comps and benefits first. Cut the 401k benefits. Cut the food budget. So whereas over here, we say, you know, love as a business strategy is where you actually prioritize people. You put people at the center of all those decisions because they are ultimately uh, responsible for driving profits for your business. So how do you empower them? How do you enable them? to drive your business to success because people and profit can coexist. They are not opposites or polar, opposites or exclusive. Mohammed started his business, Softway, back in 1999. They offered custom technology solutions like apps and e-commerce sites. And in the early days, it was all so simple. When I first started the company, I was 20 years old and I uh, started it with my brother and uh, some classmates from college. So it was definitely the startup environment, the culture that was typical of startups where, you know, we're eating, sleeping, <laughs> working day, night, hustling as much as possible and a lot of camaraderie. We take care of each other. We help each other and so forth. So that's how it started. But as we began to become successful and grow as an organization, our culture started to take a turn and had to do a lot with me as the CEO of the company. As we began to grow, you know, we had over 300 employees uh, within 10 years. And uh, I think success got to my head and I started to model behaviors from other leaders of larger corporations that I had witnessed or interacted with. And uh, our culture then took a turn to where it was more based on fear. I followed the command and control approach it's my way or the highway approach and led with behaviors that really create an environment of fear on the company. So people were not showing up with their true self or putting their heart and passion into what they were doing. It was just like, hey, do whatever gets us to get the paycheck and get the minimal work done. A lot of people would bring about feedback, but I wasn't willing to listen, right? Because in my mind, this is what you need to do. This is how you become successful. This is how you make profits. This is what is necessary for the organization to be successful. And I was also quite honestly trying to mimic 
quite a bit of the other organizations out there and say, but this is how it's done. So I hear you, but this is business. So I created that kind of an environment, not knowing what I was doing. By the time Chris joined in 2015, things had taken a turn. You had this organization of people who were skilled and talented, but you could hear a pin drop when you walked into the office. It was like super quiet. You know, the median age in our organization is like 32 or 34 or something like that. Um, so it's really young, but it's like you could hear pin drops. The culture at Softway had soured, literally. So there was a really distinct story in the book about a harsh email you sent regarding mm -hmm. a dirty fridge in the break room. So first off, how dirty was the fridge in the break room? It was really dirty. <laughs> it was bad. I mean, not trying to rationalize why I wrote the email, but there were lunch boxes in there that had all kinds of, uh, let's just say it was like a science experiment. It was really bad. <laughs> so, so you sent a message. What was that message like? Well, the message was downright aggressive. It called into question people's home training. I accused people of being lazy with a lot of like passive aggressive tone in there. And I basically said, hey, look, it's a privilege for you to have a refrigerator here. So if you're not going to keep it clean, I have the right to take it away, like all kinds of threats. And then also threaten them to get to clean the fridge no later than end of day and acknowledge this email you know, in a very threatening tone. I personally did not respond because I was like, you ain't getting that from me. Like, <laughs> like uh, you know, I still, I'm still Alice Petrie's son, so there's no way that we're going to do that. Uh, my honest reaction, if I were to be completely candid, was um, he lost his mind, but somebody needs to help him find it. And me being this new hire, I'm not using the fridge. I don't understand the fridge politics. I don't know whose stuff is in there. I've never opened it. But now I'm being accused of being lazy. You know, my home training is all in question. So he's brought my mom into this, right? So, <laughs> and I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? So that email, unfortunately, got circulated with ex-employees, made it to Glassdoor, and it became the laughing stock. Look what the CEO of Softway is up to. And uh, even in that moment, I still justified it. I rationalized it. And I was not willing to have it any other way. That's how blinded I was. And my uh, peers, who are other directors at that time, they were talking and they were like, Chris, we really think you should be the one to go and talk to Muhammad. <laughs> I'm saying, like, me? I just got it. I'm two weeks in, and you want me to go and have a crucial conversation with the CEO who I don't even know? Like, that's the, like, the old, let's get Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, and they're like, yeah, he'll probably listen because he doesn't know you very well. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> probably is not the confidence builder you think it is. I set up the meeting with Muhammad. It's a Friday at 4 p.m. I'm like, if this does not go well, I get to leave and exit with dignity and without eyeballs. So get into that room. And here I am, the new hire, having a conversation with the CEO about his behavior, essentially, and how he's communicating. <laughs> And I just like, hey, Muhammad, so I want to talk about that email. And I really want to understand, you know, what was your objective and what, what were you hoping to accomplish with that? And do you think there could have been another way to sort of get that outcome? <laughs> and he looks at me and he's like, Chris, you don't understand. I know you're new here. He, he's sort of like, you don't understand. I've been telling these people that they need to keep this fridge clean because this is a privilege. It's not a right. I don't have to give them a fridge. <laughs> I was like, right. Going in the wrong direction. <laughs> I was like, I'm about, I'm about to be known as the person who got the fridge taken away. Oh, immediately I was justifying why I did what I did. I wasn't having it. I wasn't willing to listen to him. I was rationalizing everything and justifying my actions, justifying my email. And then I finally just like ripped the bayonet off and I was like, well, Muhammad, I'm just going to be honest. If we were at my last job, you would have gotten fired for sending that out because that's not how we talk to each other. That is just not the way that you unite a team. That's not the way that you communicate. That's not the way you get people sort of committed to changing their behavior. I really had like that realization moment, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Maybe I did do something wrong. The fridge email opened Muhammad's eyes to his behavior, but it was nothing compared to what happened next. Late 2015, you had what you've referred to as Softway's darkest day. Can you kind of talk about that situation and what gave rise to that? You know, our company was on the verge of bankruptcy in 2015, 2016. You know, although we had had huge successes up until that point in time, and we had been in business almost 12 years, because of the culture, because of my behaviors, our company was on the verge of bankruptcy. And in order to keep the company from shutting down, we had to do layoffs. 
We had to lay off one third of our organization, almost 100 employees all in one day. The unfortunate thing is that we did so in a very dehumanizing manner. It was not something that I was proud of. I was having all kinds of doubts in my heart in the moment, but I also was being told and reminded this is how the corporate workplace is. This is how it should be done. So I was just taking the guidance. I mean, still full ownership. I allowed it to happen and I did it. But in the moment, apparently this is the norm in the corporate workplace and that's how it should be done. So we followed suit. We followed whatever was out there known to be done in terms of layoffs and mitigate any lawsuits, mitigate any legal consequences, speak as less as possible, just let them go, right? Don't give any information, don't divulge the why, don't say anything beyond X, Y, Z. Be stoic, do it, get it done. All the people who were being laid off were asked to assemble in one conference room, one area, and then the people who were not getting laid off were asked to assemble in a different part of the office. And we announced all at once, gave them folders and said, you're being let go. There's boxes out there to go pack your stuff and a security guard to escort you to the parking garage. That was it. After that moment in time, I would say I hit the lowest point in my life. I did not know if I was the right person to continue to be the CEO of the company. I lost all my confidence. I questioned the existence of Softway. I didn't know if our company's doors would be even remain open for a month longer. I hit the lowest point in my life at that point in time, for sure. It might be hard to have sympathy for Mohammed at this point. He was a bad boss, callous, prone to angry outbursts. But in his position, Mohammed also felt isolated and stressed. And that's the way many leaders feel. So let's talk about leaders. You know, and people might roll their eyes and say, you know, cry me a river and give me a little violin to play. But being a leader is, is difficult. I mean, it, it is hard to be sitting in the corner office or whatever office you sit in and lead a team. What challenges do you feel leaders face that employees are not aware of? There's a saying, I'm, I might butcher this saying, but, you know, it gets lonely on the top. So when you're a leader, one of some of the challenges that I think leaders face out there is the stress, the pressure of performance of the company, performance of their business objectives. They're not allowed to be vulnerable and open. They have to keep, keep up this facade of like being successful and being poised and know what they're doing. And that pressure of being artificial, of being someone that's not human and that's not really internally at your core, I think puts a lot of pressure on leaders. And that's where a lot of the stress, the anxiety, the pressures come from. Yes, there's like realities of business pressure, the realities of making payroll, meeting the business needs and so forth. Those are not something I don't want to undervalue, but a lot of it is also just manufactured. And that I think is like a big part of the burden that leaders carry. And they're not able to be vulnerable and be themselves because they think that's a sign of weakness. When it comes to love as a business strategy, some leaders worry about what they lose, power, respect, and time. But leaders have so much to gain from a culture of love. Love as a business strategy allows leaders to be human, it allows them to be vulnerable and be valuable like everyone else. And so it automatically takes this pressure of being someone you're not. I'd rather be Muhammad, you know, and I'd rather be who I am as a person inside of work and outside of work. Like I, I want to be true to myself and not try to put on this other jacket when I'm entering the workplace. So love as a business strategy allows us to create a culture where your team members become your support system and you see each other as humans first before titles. And you're able to now go into a workplace knowing that you're not alone on this journey. You have a lot of people around you who can support you, help you, and it makes your job a lot more easier. So there are a lot of benefits to leaders in following the culture of love. Mohammed was lost. His company was crumbling, his staff avoided him, and he felt like a failure. He didn't know where to turn, but he was about to have an experience that would change his life forever. A couple of weeks after the layoffs, I received tickets to go to my alma mater's football game. 
I was looking forward to a distraction. I wanted to just forget about everything that was going on with the work and life. And I just wanted to just go have a good time. And, and we were having a Cinderella season up until that point in time. So I went into the game. It was We were ranked, playing another ranked opponent. But unfortunately, going to the fourth quarter, we were losing by 20 points, playing with a third string quarterback and the stadium was emptying out. <laughs> ESPN game tracker predicted we had 0.1% chance to win that night. And so I was disappointed as well, debated if I should also, uh, you know, leave the stadium and go home. But something inside of me told me, stay back, be there to watch the game. And I'm glad I did because I ended up witnessing one of the best comebacks in Cougar football history. We won that night with less than 30 seconds left on the clock by 35 to 34, watching the press conference of then rookie head coach Tom Herman, who had taken us on a 10 and 0 uh, record till that point in time. And, uh, you know, one of the reporters asked him, hey, what had led to the success that night or the resiliency and the comeback victory that night? And it's what he said that changed the course of my life. He said it was love. It was love and support that the football players had for one another. Genuine, you have my heart in your hand kind of love. And that's the kind of love that is required to go win championship games. And as he was saying all of this, you know, I was introspecting and asking myself, do I love my team? Do I care for my team the way Coach Tom Herman is describing? And the resounding answer that kept coming back was, no, I didn't. I did not care for my team the way he was describing. And that's when I had that realization that something has to change. And if I need to build a culture of love inside the walls of my business to emulate the success that the University of Houston Cougar football team was having, then I needed to change my behaviors and how I treated people and how I behaved with people. And that was the start of the journey. When Mohammed brings up a culture of love with leaders, they often misunderstand. It is not the romantic type of love. It is the love where we can hold people accountable through trust and empathy. And love is not soft. It actually enables you to have tough conversations, tough love. And so for us, love is not always just about being nice and cordial and warm and happy-go-lucky, holding hands and skipping through the daisies. For us, it's about really ensuring that people can say what needs to be said to get the thing done right? It means having the tough conversations. It means turning controversy and confrontation into effective and powerful conversations that actually might change the solution. It might open up an idea. It might open up a revenue stream, right? And we have plenty of stories in our organization where one conversation that started out to be sort of that uncomfortable, like, I don't think this is the way it should be, or I don't like this, or this is rubbing me wrong, turn into an opportunity, turn into a new partnership, turn into a better or deeper relationship with a client. After feeling so lost, Muhammad held on to Coach Herman's words for dear life. He was excited to turn the page and share the culture of love with his teammates. The day after hearing that press conference, we had a company town hall meeting with our entire organization and I decided to tell them I love you all. It was like somebody passed gas in church. It was <laughs> not, not, not a good, like, everybody was just like, uh, what? And nobody trusted it. Nobody believed it. I got the strangest and the weirdest looks. People were rolling their eyes like, is this the same CEO that just laid off one third of the company is now telling us he loves us? What is going on? So I realized that, wait, I needed to really stop <laughs> with the declaration and I needed to first learn to walk the talk. So... I went on a journey of just working on myself, trying to build a self-awareness of how I was being experienced by others and had to go on a commitment journey to try and strive to change my behaviors. Mohammed realized that if he wanted to create change, it was up to him to lead the way. The reality is the leaders have a magnified influence on the culture of any organization. Their behaviors set the tone. So from the topmost leadership, if you want to see an effective culture transformation, it has to begin with leaders. Everyone has to get on board, but the starting process has to be with leadership. It has to begin with the topmost leaders embracing the culture of love and behaving and acting in ways that represents it because that sets the tone. It gives the permission. It gives 
other people the inspiration to follow their footsteps. But leaders aren't always sure where to start when it comes to culture. So what do you think some of the misconceptions leaders have about culture? When they think they're driving culture, they're creating culture, what, what, what do you think some of the common misconceptions they have? Leaders look at culture as, you know, the ice cream shops, the free food, the table tennis table, and, you know, all of those things as the definition of culture, great culture. And the reality is those are just perks and benefits. They are not culture. And that is the biggest misconception I have found. It's like, well, we have, you know, Taco Tuesdays and we have goat, <laughs> yoga, goat yoga on Thursdays. And I'm like, that is not culture. That is just perks and benefits. So culture is ultimately the culmination of how we behave with one another, how we treat one another. That emotional environment that we create is what culture is. And it is an intangible. With his misguided, I love you speech, Mohammed had stumbled upon an important lesson. Culture isn't what you say, it's what you do. Think of it this way. Uh, I know we've heard of the saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast by Peter Drucker. And we are very fond of that saying and we truly believe in it. But at Softway and Culture Plus, we have a saying, if culture eats strategy for breakfast, then behaviors eat culture for lunch. Because at the end of the day, uh, whatever culture you aspire to build, it starts with the culmination of how we behave with one another. So behaviors at the foundation, they're the bottom line that makes a difference to your financial statements. And the key to changing culture or strengthening culture is changing behaviors of people. Chris points out that emotions aren't behaviors. Behaviors are what you do in response to emotions. I truly believe that when you're angry, everybody behaves differently. But unfortunately, especially in the workplace, everyone sees anger in one form of behavior, which is usually yelling and aggression. But when you're angry <laughs> and you're not aggressive, you can be passive, you could be quiet, you can ice people out, you can play mind games. I will be sarcastic with you. I will say the sharp, biting comment that just shuts you down. That's where I go when I'm angry. And so once I understood that personally, I just saw someone who maybe wasn't as self-aware with his anger, but also I wasn't there to judge. And so for a while there, whenever he was triggered, we just had this agreement that he would exit the room <laughs> and I would follow and we would just talk about it. And after a while, he didn't need that because he found ways to emotionally regulate. As part of this journey, Mohammed had to redefine what it meant to be a leader. I think we have to understand our role as a leader. What does it mean to be a leader? Our job is to make other people's job easier. Our job is to make them more successful, set them up in their career, make sure that they're doing the best work of their lives. Our job is to remove those obstacles, empower them and give them everything necessary, tools, resources to be successful. But as long as we're in this mindset of, well, I'm a leader, so I'm the more powerful, I'm the one who owns this, you know, as long as we come with that mindset, we're going to expect other people to come serve us. And to be become a leader, we have to first fundamentally reset our mindset, reset our operating system, as I would call it, what it means to be a leader. And then when you can like start creating your behaviors, your policies, your processes that represent the roles of a leader is there to really serve the people, then everything else starts to fall in place. Mohammed's favorite example of this, open door policies. So first of all, I think open door policies suck. Sorry for my language, but I think it's just another way to say, hey, look, I have an office. I'm your boss. You want to talk to me? My door's open. Come walk the hall of shame to come talk to me. I think that in itself is not serving of others. I think that's a policy that needs to be long gone. Leaders need to walk up to their team members. Leaders need to go to their team members where they are and say, hey, how can I help you? Not sit in your cozy office and say, I have an open door, come walk in anytime you like. It's still intimidating as hell for people to even do that. I personally did that, so I'm guilty, but I had to then realize that I'm here to serve them. They're not here to serve me, so I need to go out to them. I should never ask them to come to my office. I think if, if leaders get anything from this podcast, that one statement is probably as important as, as uh, if they could just take that one thing away, I think it would hugely uh, improve their relationship with their employees. By reimagining his role, Mohammed knew what behaviors he wanted to emulate, and he started doing them. 
he started to really change how he showed up. So one of the things that you should know about Muhammad is his awesome wife, Yulia. She's a five-time Olympic medalist um, in diving, and she's also a great chef. And so she usually makes his lunch and it's delicious, like amazing, a totally different meal every single day. And he would bring extras and let people sort of eat along with him. So he started to offer up things that she would make to people. And everyone strategically tried to eat with Muhammad <laughs> during, the, during that time because it's like, who doesn't want to pass up on this really, you know, grade A quality food because she was only organic. And so that was one of the ways that he really tried to start serving people in a way that didn't require anybody to do anything differently or the processes and sort of workflow to change. Mohammed didn't make grand gestures. He took small, consistent steps. If employees stayed late, he stayed with them. When they went home, he left them thank you notes on their desk. Once a team had to come in over the weekend. And he knew that that took away from family time. So Muhammad went out and bought gift cards to take the families out so that, you know, the employees could actually make up that time on Muhammad's dime um, for the overage. So he started doing those like really small things to not just say that he loved people, but to show it and let people see that it was real. And something else happened too. Muhammad's behavior began to bring about change in others. And watching Muhammad change, I had to be real about how I showed up in certain situations, right? I have this thing that I struggle with constantly, which is, I'm going to tell you once, and if you choose to go forward, I'm like, I'm done. Like, you in that ditch by yourself, but I'm not helping, right? And so really helping others realize like, hey, sometimes people need to hear it more than once. <laughs> sometimes people need someone to sit alongside them and work with them as they make calls or decisions, right? And so really changing my mindset to be of service and to not necessarily do the work for people, but to sit alongside them as they do it. So that way they could be more self-sustaining afterward. They could learn a new skill. They could sort of apply it forward. So for me, it really was about shifting mindset and service mindedness to be even more conscious of how I'm coming across, but also how my voice or talent or knowledge is being transferred into the team that's doing the work. This is how a culture of love gets implemented. It starts quietly at the top. I think the key is that we have to act before we expect. So the leaders have to start behaving and acting in ways that are different that is representative of the culture of love so people can truly believe it and see that, wait, this is real. The, the leaders are behaving differently. The leaders aren't poking my presentation like they used to. They're not focused on the font size. They're actually focused on, on what is the substance of the presentation. Something's different about my leader all of a sudden, right? They got to experience those differences first, those changes in behaviors first before they become believers of the culture of love themselves. Actually, the way that we went about it is we didn't require or sort of stand up new values and vision and tell everybody to get on board. Muhammad first started it himself. And then what he wanted to do is after he started to change, he started inviting feedback from the contributor level. And as he was talking to them, the feedback came less about him and more about us as leaders. And that's when he realized, OK, now I need to get my leaders on board. So we actually did a two day offsite and we brought all of the leaders and we had our team write anonymous letters about how we as leaders made them feel. And I remember that some of them you know, actually said, when I'm with you guys, I just feel so small. I feel like I'm unheard. Like, like you hear some of those things. And that was sort of the big awakening for the leadership team. And we encourage everybody, like, if, you've, if you're a leader who's never gotten honest feedback, you should try and solicit some anonymous letters because you might get some honesty that you haven't really gotten in your career. And as a result of that, that's when the work really transformed. Muhammad was growing as a leader and management had begun to change too. But there was still hesitation from his employees because there was still something important Muhammad hadn't done. So I think the biggest journey for me was reaching a journey of forgiveness. And the biggest obstacle for me was short of apologizing. I just couldn't get to the point of apologizing until about a year and a half into my journey when I then openly apologized to the whole organization and seek forgiveness is when I think it started to flip 
where people were then able to really see that I was genuinely trying. I was genuinely human. And I think when that grace was extended to me, things started to move a lot faster. Grace and forgiveness are key parts of the culture of love. You should still be able to empathize with people who might have messed up or made a mistake. And so as a team, we, we also do like to make sure that we provide each other grace, right? I, th I think that probably some of the most powerful words that anybody can ever speak was, I was wrong and I'm sorry. And, and those are very difficult for anybody to say. I mean, in relationships, at work, anything. So, you know, I commend you on, on getting to that point. After that moment in time, that was a very pivotal moment in our journey that led us to then operate at a more unified front and uh, were able to do things that we were not able to do before and that propelled our business outcomes. It helped us become a profitable business again. We tripled our revenues, improved our EBITDA margins by 42 percentage points, reduced our attrition from 30% to 12%, you know, started to grow our accounts with customers, like everything just started to become more and more positive as a result of that. Chris could see the whole company had changed. The reason why I can say I saw it is because clients saw it. And so when our clients came back and said, you guys are a different organization, a different team. Like we had this one client group where our meetings started out to be like 30 minute check-ins weekly. And then the 30 minutes grew into an hour. The hour grew into two hours. The two hours grew into four hours on site. And then we would just spend the whole day with this client. We would all be working on different things, but they just enjoyed the environment and the atmosphere so much so that they didn't want to go back to their desks. <laughs> In fact, the shift had led to a whole new business, Culture Plus. When we finally encountered this culture of love and tried to bring it into the workplace and experimented with our own environment, one of our largest customers noticed our transformation and asked us, hey, can you help us with our leaders and our culture? And we're like, wait a minute, we're a technology firm. We don't do that kind of stuff. But they pushed us and empowered us to do a pilot. And that pilot led us to travel the whole world we trained 1,400 leaders from 46 different nationalities and backgrounds. We traveled to 10 different countries all over the world. And we imparted training on how to lead with love. And every session we went, we met humans from every corner of the globe with different backgrounds, differences in language, religion, ethnicity, gender, you name it. And every one of them resonated with the concept of love. And they were like, this needs to be shared with the world. This deserves the world to know that this is the way to move forward. And anything and everything we do, we want to bring back humanity to the workplace. Muhammad is by no means perfect, but now he's better equipped to deal with his mistakes. At the company, they've coined the phrase, oh, Mo is having a moment, M-O-H-M-E-N-T, which means I'm, I'm reverting back to maybe some of my past behaviors. But, but at the same time, I think that is self-awareness, right? You don't like flip the switch and all of a sudden you're like this great human. It's a journey. And the more you can catch yourself doing those things, it's a victory. It's, it's a win in my mind because now I'm at least having the awareness, wait a minute, what I just told Patrick wasn't the right thing to say. I need to take it back or apologize versus before I wouldn't even care. I wouldn't even know I had done something wrong because I had no awareness. So it's a journey. This journey is a never ending journey. It's a permanent state of transformation, so you're never done. And also we're human and we all make mistakes. We all have moments. We all have stressors that sometimes can push us to the limits. But what's beautiful about the culture of love is people accept that. People appreciate that. People can have bad days, can have moments, but it's how we show up for each other in those moments is what is different than if you were not practicing a culture of love, where people are forgiving, where people are now empathetic and appreciate and want to help and say, hey, Mo, I see you're having a moment. Can I do anything? Is there something that's bothering you? Can I help you? Versus before, if I had a moment, first of all, I wouldn't even be aware of it. And then secondly, everybody else would be just scared and not even care and run away as far as possible. In a culture of love, it would be the other way around, where they will actually reach out to you, want to help you, want to support you. And Muhammad thinks that if he could do it, anyone can. So what about leaders who tell you, well, we'd love to do this, but we just don't have time? 
I tell you, you're just making an excuse. I have a whole chapter in the book called No Excuses. It's the last chapter. Every single excuse that I've heard in my whole career for leaders, including my own, I have a rebuttal for every single one of them. I will tell you, it doesn't cost you money. It doesn't cost you uh, time because all we're asking you is to treat one another better. Treat one another with love. And trust me, you don't need ping pong tables. You don't need ice cream parlors. In fact, when we were bankrupt, we were broke. We couldn't do any of those things. We had to find ways to build a culture just by the way we treat one another. And guess what? It doesn't take time. You just have to show up to the meetings and treat your teammates with that love and compassion and kindness, which doesn't cost anything. So it doesn't cost you time. It doesn't cost you money. So those excuses are down the drain. They don't work. And though the change is hard, it's worth it. Because we believe that if you want to see a change in the world, a place that we have ignored far too long is the workplace. And if we can help institute change in the workplace, then we might be able to change the world. I hope you've learned as much as I did from Mohammed's journey. A culture of love can be transformative, both your bottom line and your business life. I suggest you think about your team. Do you have a culture of love? Do your employees feel the same? It's up to you as the leader to be the catalyst. Think about the kind of leader you want to be and act accordingly. Behaviors are the bricks with which you build your culture. Even if it's hard, remember, leading with love is free and the benefits could be enormous. There are no excuses. But there's so much more to learn about the culture of love. Tangible frameworks, hiring strategies, and ways to build it into the fabric of your business. And that's why Chris and Muhammad will be back next week to discuss how to revolutionize your communications empower your employees, and harness the power of tough love. Thank you to Mohammed Anwar and Chris Petrie. We've only scratched the surface of love as a business strategy. But if you want to learn more, check out their best-selling book, or better yet, their podcast. We'll link to both in the show notes. And if you've been inspired to become a better leader, consider this. We have programs that we offer called Seneca Leaders, where we basically take leaders through an introspective journey to build that self-awareness and get them to realize that, wait a minute, I'm not the leader who I think I am. It's inspired by obviously love as a business strategy. But if you've read the book, trust me, it's nothing like the book. It is a very transformational experience that leaders go through to build that self-awareness. And it's done in a very psychologically safe manner, but you will come out of that session committed to transform. And if you personally are a CEO and a leader, I would highly encourage you to go to our website, SenecaLeaders.com to find upcoming Seneca Leader sessions. Uh, we are actually hosting Seneca Leader events at the University of Houston Football Stadium, where it all began for an experience. But we also travel occasionally for destination training. So you can get up to date details on events that you and your leaders and your managers can attend and uh, build that self-awareness muscle. If you enjoyed the show, we'd appreciate it if you'd write a review in your podcast app. Or if you're short on time, you can just rate us five stars. It only takes a second. And while you're there, subscribe. We'd love to have you. Because when you're with us, we're in good companies. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Sheena Cochran is our production coordinator. Our executive producer is Daniel Cornell, with writing and production from Andrew Gannam and sound design and mixing by Ben Cranlett, Lower Street Media. I'm your host, Patrick Pacheco.